My dear friends, my friends who are watching us online, ain't it just the best when your plans are ruined? <laughs> I'm sorry, they, they tell you at the seminary, never ever be sarcastic from the pulpit. So let me take that back. Let me change it. Life is so much better when things go, go according to plan, right? Uh, a lot of people were asking me after Easter, hey, how'd your Easter go? And I said, you know what? It was great. Because all of our church members helped volunteer. It was coordinated pretty well. I felt like we were never, you know, rushing to get something figured out. We had 400 people at our sunrise service. The Easter brunch went really well. We had plenty of food. No one went hungry. And Pastor Patterson wore his white suit. Everything went according to plan. Which I guess is probably a pretty good definition of what peace is. Peace, just having your plans and everything going the way it's supposed to. Nothing is messed up. Nothing is lacking. Everything's right. That, that's what peace is. And so when things don't go according to plan, you can really, really feel that lack of peace in your life. I was 10 years old. We moved to Texas when I was eight. My dad's an Oklahoma Sooner fan. He was watching the Red River rivalry, and I was reading on the TV Texas. I was like, oh, I live in Texas. I should be a Texas fan. So I was a Texas Longhorn fan, and there were some members at my church, and they were diehard Longhorn fans. They heard that I was interested in the Longhorn. So what did they do? They bought me all the stuff. They took me to out to eat and said, now, this is why you want to be a Longhorn fan. I was like, this is great. And they even said, hey, Cotton Bowl against LSU, New Year's Day game. Here's what we're going to do, Joel. We're going to take you from your family because they cheer for the Sooners. And we're going to bring you over to our house. You're going you're to spend New Year's Eve with us. The next morning, we're going to have a big brunch. And then we're going to go to the game and we're going to pay for everything. I was like, oh, this is going to be amazing. So while we were at church for the New Year's Eve service, I was standing up praying, and then all of a sudden, I went, oh no. And I almost made it to the bathroom when I got sick. And I tried to play it off like it wasn't that bad, but I had the 24-hour flu, and my plans were ruined. Oh, it was so Dad, all these joys and experience and wonderful things that were going to happen, and, and they all got ruined. Life gets really hard when our plans are messed up. Um, it's one thing when your plans get messed up that the consequences are just that you don't get to go to a game, but it's another thing when it has real life difficulties and struggles. Right, to have all the plans laid out. Oh, here, we're going to go on vacation here, but then you lose your job. You lose your peace. Or you think, oh, I'm going to have all these awesome experiences, go to all my grandkids' uh, baseball and basketball and soccer games, but then the doctor says, it's cancer. Plans are ruined. Or you think, oh, we're going to build such a wonderful life together, and then he breaks up with you. Or you think, I'm going to live this life that is so God-pleasing, and then you get stuck in the chains of addiction. Or you think, I'm going to have all these wonderful memories with Grandma and Grandpa, and then death takes them away. Or you think, I'm going to have such a just calm, regular, stress-free life. I'm not going to have too many highs, too many lows, but then the memory of your abuser haunts you so that you can't even function on a normal day. When your plans get ruined, what you have is a lack of peace. And when you have no peace, it leads to real emotional damage. It can bring you into this place of real anger and hostility, either at God or at the people around you. Or it leads you into this other place of just sadness and despair and apathy and depression. Which is not what God wants for us. Now, we live in a world where our plans get ruined, but God says he wants you to have peace. When Jesus showed up to his disciples on that Easter, 
He walked in the room, and the first thing he said to him was, Peace be with you. And so that's our goal for today. As we come to God uh, with a life full of ruined plans and peace that is disrupted, we're going to open up God's word, and he's going to bring peace into our lives. And we'll do that with the book of Acts, chapter 18, starting at verse 1. It's on page 1. Or 1,098 in your pew Bible, if you want to follow along. Acts chapter 18, starting at verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. All right, there's some backstory here. The book of Acts, right? We always want to read the Bible in context. So let's start with the book. The book of Acts might as well be called the history of the early Christian church. Okay, so Jesus came, and he did his thing, and he ascended into heaven, and now we have Acts. What happened after Jesus ascended? What happened to all those Christians? And that's the history in the book of Acts. And one of the main characters in this history is a guy named Paul. Paul was a super enemy of Christians. He hunted them down and killed them. And one day, he was like, I'm going to go up to Damascus, And go find those Christians there and kill them. But on the way, Jesus appeared to him and said, "Uh, yeah, Paul, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm trying to serve you, Jesus. He's like, you're killing my followers. Please stop. He's like, oh, okay. Went blind. And then he was healed. He was baptized. He became a follower of Jesus. He became a Christian. And he became one of the greatest church starters in all of Christian history. He was going from town to town to town starting churches. And on one of these missionary journeys for Paul, he was going through the region and he was stopping all these cities trying to tell people about Jesus and it wasn't going well. He went to the city of Philippi and he healed a demon-possessed girl. Awesome, right? And he's so excited to tell all these people about Jesus, but then his plans got ruined. They threw him into jail. But God... Sent a miracle, released him from jail. The jailer became baptized, and he thinks, great, things are going well. But the government asked him to leave. So he leaves Philip and I, and he goes to the city of Thessalonica. And he says, I have plans. I'm going to tell people about Jesus in this city of Thessalonica. What happened? Well, they ran him out of that city too. So he goes to Berea, and he starts telling people about Jesus in Berea. And things are going great. And then what happened? The Bereans didn't kick him out. No, the Thessalonians came down to Berea and kicked him out of Berea. So Paul goes down to Athens, and he tells people about Jesus in Athens. Yeah. So he finally makes it to Corinth. Things have not been going very well for Paul. His plans have been ruined. And what's he going to do? Well, I guess I'll give it one more try, but we'll see. So this is where we pick up the story. Paul is in Corinth after Athens, and verse 2. There... He met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered that all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to the preaching and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest, and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue. He went next door to the house of uh, Titius, Justus, the worshiper of God, Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed. In the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who had heard him believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have put many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. It's God's word. Look at how Paul's plans were ruined. You know, he probably had intentions to go and tell everyone about Jesus in Corinth, but he didn't have the funds to do so, so he had to spend some of his time making tents. 
And then he got his friend Aquila and Priscilla to help him out, and, and Silas and Timothy came down, so now he can dedicate himself to the preaching and teaching. And he's going to the Jews, and he's telling them about Jesus, and he's thinking, oh, maybe. Then they kick him out. I mean, how frustrated do you have to be? Like, Paul has these amazing plans, and yet time and time again, it just doesn't work out. I love what Jesus says to him. Paul, me, Jesus, letting you know I'm with you. Go ahead and keep on preaching and teaching. Don't be silent because no one will harm you. If you are lacking peace in your life because your plans seem to not be going according to plan, there's two truths that we learn here from Jesus that give us real peace. The first truth is Jesus, our Lord, is alive. Just let that sink in. Jesus is not your savior who rose from the dead and then ascended into heaven as some mythical, out of touch, not present being. No, Jesus came and spoke to Paul with his word and he encouraged him and said, hey, I got you. Think about that encouragement that Paul had then. He knew that the almighty God was alive and with him. And I wonder if he was thinking back and realizing, oh yeah, look at that, he was with me the whole time. Having to build tents, his living Lord gives him companions. And then Titus and Silas come so that he can give full time to the preaching and teaching. And then what happens, they kick him out of the synagogue, and where does he end up? Next door at someone who came to faith, and he has a big house right next to the synagogue, and the synagogue ruler also join this church. And as the attacks are coming against him, Jesus comes to him and says, hey, I'm with you. I think that's important for us to remember. That he is risen. risen Hallelujah. And he still is. Jesus doesn't just rise on Easter. He is risen. And he is risen today. And Jesus gives you a promise. And he says... I will always be with you. He gave that promise to his disciples. He gave that promise to Paul. And he gives that promise to you. So have some confidence in life. Living confidence because a living Savior is with you. That's the first truth that will help give you peace no matter what happens in this life. The second one. We have to watch out for the lie that people sometimes take away from this text. What did Jesus say to Paul? I'm alive. I am with you. Have no fear. No one will attack you. And people can read that and think, hey, you know what? I'm a Christian. The living Savior is with me. That means no one will ever attack me. That means that my plans should never be ruined. That means that life of a Christian will be prosperous. That's not what God's word says. In fact, Jesus says being a follower of Jesus means you'll go through sufferings and persecution. And I love this like fun little fact. If you still have this part marked out, verse 11 is great. Verse 12 doesn't make any sense. Verse 11, Jesus says to Paul, oh, sorry, verse 10, I am with you. No one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. No one's going to attack him. Verse 12, while Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia, Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into the court. Did Jesus not keep his promise? Paul, no one's going to attack you. Next verse, people attacked Paul. What's the second truth? Jesus came to Paul and said, I want you to keep preaching because no one's going to attack you. Why? Because there are many people in this city that he still wants. And after a year and a half, 
and Paul had done all the work that he wanted him to do, what happened? They attacked him. Because that was Jesus' plan. Truth number two. The truth that gives us living confidence. All things go according to Jesus' plan. There is nothing that can ruin Jesus' plan. And you go, wait a second. There is a lot of bad things that happen in life. There are a lot of bad things that happen to me. Are you telling me that my good and gracious God wanted that for me? Let's be clear on this. God is not the author of evil. God does not tempt you. That all comes from the devil. And I bet the devil was just waiting to unleash an attack on Paul. But here's an amazing thing. I've said this before and I'll say it again. How much of a power play is it of God that he allows the devil to do his worst and he still can't ruin God's plans? What happened after a year and a half? The devil led the Jews to attack Paul. What happened? Paul had to leave Corinth. And what did he do? He shared the gospel with more and more and more people. And the gospel spread throughout the whole world. Despite the de best efforts of the devil, he could not ruin God's plans. And the same is true for you in your life. Jesus says, I am living. I am the living Savior, and I am always with you. And he says, no one can ruin my plans. And so if something bad happens in your life, if something goes not according to your plans, guess what? You're still going according to Jesus' plan. And what is Jesus' plan for you? What is the ultimate goal for Jesus in your life? I will work out all things for the good of those who love me. Jesus is always good, and his plan for you is always good. In the moment, it may not feel like it, because your plans got ruined. But we have a living confidence that our living Savior is always with us. Nothing goes against his plan, which gives us... There are two other characters in this story that I think apply well to. Priscilla and Aquila. Think about what happened in their life. They had their house established in Italy, in Rome. Probably was a nice place. I've never been to Italy, but I hear it's nice. And what happened? They got kicked out of their home. They had to leave the country because the government said so. And where did they end up? In this city of Corinth? Like, their plans got ruined. <laughs> but they had a living Savior, and... His plans did not get ruined. What happened? They connected with Paul. They were able to support him and encourage him. After Paul left, Priscilla and Aquila actually taught another character. His name is Apollos. And Apollos became one of the, another great teacher and preacher for the church and for Jesus. Look at how Jesus used Priscilla and Aquila and the ruined plans of their life to accomplish his good and perfect plan. Or another example... Take Joel Herring for an example. Me. I had plans. Uh, son of a pastor, going to the seminary, going to be a pastor. I had it all lined out. And I won't get into details, but personal struggles with addiction led me to be very worried that my plans were in jeopardy. And I prayed, God, please, like, help me overcome this thing that I'm so powerless against. And I struggled, and I struggled, and I struggled. And I'm like, God, why? Where are you? Why won't you help me? It was crushing. Hard to go to church. And I was going to be a pastor. And then... When I had gone through that long enough, according to God's plan, he gave me friends in my life who talked to me, who shared the gospel with me, reminded me that I am a baptized child of God. He gave me the courage to tell the dean of students at the seminary, literally the guy who could kick me out of the seminary. Terrifying. I would never have done that, but God gave me that. And, and he, he, according to his plans, 
Help me overcome this addiction. Still always going to be in recovery against. And I go, why, why did God let me go through that? Do you know what my first job was out of the seminary? I worked at a high school. Did you know that high school boys struggle with sin? It happens. And you know what I was able to do? I was able to say, hey guys, let me tell you about my story and my struggles, and let me warn you about the dangers, and let me give you the defenses against temptation and addiction, and let me show you what you need in order to know who you are and to be rooted in the gospel. And, and like, guys are still calling me four years later and going, hey, pastor, can we talk? I go, who is this? And they're like, you don't probably remember who I am, so I could use some help. But things did not go according to my plans, but Jesus had a plan. And he has used me and my struggles and my frustrations and my lack of peace to, to accomplish his good and perfect will. So the question is, what is it that's going on in your life? What are the plans that are, that are being destroyed that you had all lined up? What is the thing that is taking away your peace? Remember the truths. Remember the truths that give you a living confidence no matter what happens. Truth number one, you have a living Savior and Lord who is with you. Truth number two, Nothing can ruin his plans. And when we remember these truths, what we receive from God then is a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace that when you go through this life that is full of ruined plans and frustrations and anxieties and stresses, and yet when your friends look at you going through that and they go, I see the struggles, and yet you have a joy and you have a contentment that doesn't make any sense. What is that? You get to say, I have a peace that surpasses all understanding. I have a living Savior who's with me, and I know nothing can ruin his plan. Brothers and sisters, hold on to that peace. Have in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.